Show me, man. Hey guys, I'm Sai, and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, the home of the Andy Campbell Show, Andy Campbell Football Show, should I say. This is episode number 63. The show is available live on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter, and Periscope. Ace Podcast Nation, also your home for many great shows and series featuring top guests, expert analysts, and more. So please follow us on social media and uh, check out the upcoming shows and guests Subscribe to the YouTube channel as we've been stuck on the same number for the last couple of weeks. As well as uh, all that, you can find the audio versions to every single show at your favourite radio and podcasting app. The the links to all of that is in the description and in the closing credits at the end of the show. And uh, just before I move on, a little shout out to my three not-so-little boys who uh, I'm not going to see all week because my bathroom's being ripped to pieces. So, uh, shout out to uh, Ellis, Aidan, and Charlie. And uh, I'll, that's it. I'll start crying, mate. Otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, massive thank you to Black Diamond Sports, global sports agency representing sports stars around the world. For more information, you can visit their social media pages, the links to which are in the description. And, of course, their brand new shiny website, which looks phenomenal. And uh, you can check out all their stuff there. Big thank you to them for their support around the show. And uh, also, huge thank you to Darren Ralston and Bespoke's Financial who are sponsoring today's show. And uh, here's a, a quick word from them. My mummy and daddy have been talking about life insurance. It sounds like something to protect my brother and me, but I don't really understand. Then my auntie Louise told mummy about Bespoke Financial Teesside. She said they're a local company who helped her with her life insurance. Mummy got in touch and because they're based locally, a man called Darren was able to come to our house. He was really friendly. Darren stayed for a cup of tea and made it all really easy to understand. He said that life insurance will protect our home and family if anything bad were to happen. Like if mummy or daddy got sick, then we'd get enough money to take care of us and our house would be paid for so we wouldn't get taken away. After an hour, Darren said goodbye and Mummy and Daddy seemed a lot happier. Once it was all sorted, we could all relax and watch a film together as a family. I don't know why they didn't do it sooner. Yeah, big thanks to Bespoke Financial. Of course, they specialise in life insurance, critical critical illness, income protection, mortgages and sports cover. So check out them as they are the the insurance provider in the Teesside area and they're branching out to other cities around the UK. Uh, of course, joining me this evening, first of all, I have the goal collector, the speed demon, still the king of the Millennium Stadium, ex-Cardiff City Middlesbrough striker, Mr Andy Campbell. How are you, mate? I'm all right, mate, yeah. Glad to be back. It's nice to... Uh, these. these... These shows just uh, seem to roll into one, but yeah, good show on Friday. But um, super it's excited for this one. This has been uh, loads of like super no- negotiation to try and get Robbie on. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm pleased to have him on because I've got some great stories, by the way. Because uh, um, I'm not sure if a lot of people know, especially the Cardiff lot who watch our show, that uh, that me and Robbie grew up um, quite closely and played together for oh, for donkey's years from uh, from uh, from a really young age. So yeah, it's going to be. Uh, I think we've got a bit of dirt on each other, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Might be fun. It'll be fun, yeah. yeah be careful, well, yeah. be careful, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, can cut you off. I, can, I, I think I can cut you off, though, Rob. <laughs> Funny enough, Friday show, which is Jeff Winter, was a cracker. It was really good. Yeah, was, yeah. Talking about refereeing and VAR. So if you haven't seen that yet, I encourage you all to check that out because it was really good, really funny. Uh, me and Jeff got a bit feisty but towards each other, which was fun as well. Oh, yeah, you did. Fun. So but, before um, we uh, before we I mean, introduce I introduce our guest, can I yeah, just go saw, for it. Um, someone in the in the in the in the live chat already is just uh, is just popped up and it's uh, it's George Fallows and I can I just say a quick hello to George because I popped I bumped into George at the park on um, was it yesterday or the day before George that we uh, I with him taking me little girl to the to the park so we had a we had a quick uh, quick chat and 
I miss George. We uh, we spent a lot of time together when we were uh, when I was a lot younger, uh, and he was following mm -hmm. the borough. So yeah, nice to see him. So keep watching, George. Indeed, welcome, George. And uh, yeah, I was going to say, and you just said about uh, how close you are to Robbie. So I just 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 wondering why for the last six months you've been saying you don't want to get him on, and you, you, you just uh, under uh, under all costs you must not come on. Scared, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So of course. As, uh, as we just mentioned, but joining us this evening, he's been a manager at Sunderland and Grimsby, assistant manager at Hibs in Scotland, played Premier League football for Middlesbrough, as well as playing for Sheffield Wednesday, West Ham United, Warren Rotherham, Hull City and others, as well as making five appearances for Scotland and England and 21s. Interesting. We will discuss this later. Mr. Robbie Stockdale, how are you, mate? I'm very well, guys. Very well. Yourself? Excellent, mate. Really, really oh, pleased to have you on, Rob. Really pleased to have you on. It's going to be a fun one. It's going to be a good show. Can you intro? Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. Don't, don't, don't worry. We can, uh, we can, we can make sure that doesn't happen very often for the rest of the, rest of the show. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, wait till you get these questions now in the Magnificent Seven. You might not be so complimentary. <laughs> I like to drop, we like to drop a grenade or two in there, so will we drop another one this week, I suppose? We'll have to wait and see, but uh, it's going to be good, for, I'm looking forward to it, it's going to be a fun show, we're going to talk some uh, stories around the world, and then we're going to talk about Robbie's career, and uh, of course, documentary on Netflix, which you were featured in, I'm quite looking forward to that as well, yep. but uh, let's start with The Magnificent Seven, Robbie Stockdale, The Magnificent Seven, here we go, Mess nice and easy to start, Messi or Ronaldo? Ronaldo. Uh, Middlesbrough or Sunderland? <laughs> Middlesbrough. Ooh, he was controversial. Uh, best Scottish player of all time? Um, I didn't see him very often, but I suppose from clips, Daglish. Great answer. Uh, uh, your favourite TV show of all time? Oh. Do you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to say I love cooking programmes. So I'm going to go MasterChef. Oh, I like that. I love that question because everyone has a different answer. And yeah, I know. Uh, no one said cooking either before, so no. that's another good one. Uh, angriest player you've ever come across? Paulins. I think he's still angry. He's still angry. <laughs> he, was still angry, angry last, he was angry last night, by the way, if anybody watched the Man United game. <laughs> <laughs> um, England or Scotland? <laughs> Oh, that's you, that, isn't it? That's vicious, that's vicious. That's vicious. It, who's winning? No, you got to, no, who's your, who's your favourite? I will go England. <laughs> that's a and very that's... naughty question. <laughs> and to finish, who is the greatest man to come out of red car? Oh, that's a good one. I thought you might like that Oof. one. I like that one. Greatest man to come out of red car. Or red car. I can't say myself, can I? Yeah, of course you can. Say I don't, I don't know what else has come out. You'd, you'd, be in me, you'd be in me top three, I think. Uh, who, else, who else have you got, mate? Um, if I say, I, I'm probably only footballers, aren't I? So I'll probably go... Uh, was, was, was Mogga one? Was Mogga red car? I think he, he could have been. See, yeah, he could have yeah, been. I was, I was more mask growing up. Yeah, I'd say, say Mogger for me. I, 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 well, I know, I know his brother. His brother was one, so I'd, I'd go Tony. Well, I, well, I'll tell you what. Don't go any further than Tony. Legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, agree. I agree. Absolute legend. There we go. And such a nice guy as well. Yeah, totally agree. Legend, hero uh, to so many, so many football fans. By the way, not just Middlesbrough fans. You know, he's he's made a he's made a, a mark on a lot of people. What made made a mark when he was at Scotland at Celtic. Uh, he's yeah. still doing it at Blackburn now, doing a great job. So yeah, he's a he's a cracking fella, cracking fella. He's got time for everybody as well, by the way. Lovely man. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So that was uh, the Robbie Stockdale Magnificent Seven. Enjoyed that. That was gets good. Gets easy now, Rob. Don't worry. Yeah, you can, you can nice relax a little now. bit. Nice and easy now. I, nice I know which now. question you chucked in as well. So don't you, <laughs> don't think I'll, I'll forget that. So it's going to be uh, a long show this for you. Yes, you're right, like you are. We are. Well, Rob, we're going to 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 talk about any other business. So before we uh, before we go into your uh, amazing career, uh, which is obviously still ongoing, uh, which is pleasing. But yeah, any other business side. So where do you want to start? 
Um, so I, I'll start with the shortest one first because it's one which I just want to touch on briefly, which is um, Sheffield Wednesday and the EFL. Uh, there was some reports yesterday that the EFL uh, initially wanted to f uh, relegate Sheffield Wednesday and then they couldn't basically because of their own bureaucracy. Um, look, well, I'm not saying that Sheffield Wednesday should have been relegated. What I am saying is that EFL have embarrassed themselves as an organisation over the last probably six months or so. I think they've been shown to be very disorganised, very dothering, dithering, whatever you want to say, and just generally a bit of a shambles. And I think they need to sort it out real quick because they could open themselves up to all sorts of problems post-COVID if they carry on being as shambolic as they are. I don't know what you guys think about that. but I, I, sorry, I, I think I, I, the problem I've got with the EFL is is how all the leagues of the EFL are, aren't interlinked really with yeah. um, you know, the, 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 the championship kept going and it had to go because of, the, because of the Premier League. So did League One and League Two for me. You know what I mean? They had to carry on. Behind closed doors and 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 like like the championship did, it was easily done for me. You know, I, yes, finances dictate, but um, players still wanted to play. If they didn't or couldn't play, then that's that's a different scenario. But the teams at the top of the league are going for playoffs. Uh, you look at the Sunderland, the Ipswiches in League One, for example, who missed out on the playoffs. And I just felt sorry for a lot of teams, and I'm still starting to feel, I'm still continually feeling sorry for teams because, um, you know what I mean for uh, for teams who've gone down, for teams who. Uh, who didn't get the opportunity to go up, and, and for me, I, I do blame the EFL, uh, and I'm still a little bit bitter and a little bit unhappy of the way that it just doesn't seem fair for everybody. It seemed to look after the best, the best, and the biggest, the bigger leagues and the bigger teams, and the little guys just get shoved under the carpet a little bit. The thing is, mate, the, the you're right, bang on about League One and League Two. They absolutely should have finished just like the Championship and the Premier League. I can understand below that. Maybe, you know, you, everyone, not every league was going to be able to finish. We kind of knew that within a couple of months of lockdown. But once they made a decision that the Premier League and the Championship was coming back, for me, League One and League Two absolutely had to be completed mm. in some form rather than what they did. Um, I thought it was disrespectful. I thought it was, it showed the, just how much, how little they think of anything below the Premier League, but also more so below the Championship. They do not care, basically, and I think that's a problem. Um, and if I was in any of those leagues, I'd be very upset. Uh, Robbie, have you got anything to add on that, mate? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a very difficult one without knowing the full facts. I mean, it seems to me that a lot of the issues and problems um, about selling the club back to, to the owners and, and it seems very underhand to try and get a, to get a fall up, if you like. And, and the punishment sometimes doesn't fit the crime for those clubs. What I would say, um, speaking from a little bit of experience, is where I think the EFL in particular get it wrong is with people coming into clubs, they fit the proper owner's test. You know, you have the situation with Wigan at the minute, and it's, you know, it's for a football fan, never mind any allegiance to Wigan Athletic, you look what they've had to go through, and I'm talking about the staff, I'm talking about the supporters, the players. But this, these people that can come in and just basically just ruin a club overnight, where's the comeback from the EFL on that? And now they get punished with the deduction. So I actually think it's it's the people that are in the club that suffer most and the supporters. I totally agree, Rob. I, you know, I, I I feel really sorry. It's the, it's the football fans and the, and the, and the people behind the behind the scenes who get punished the most. You know because. The fans are there through thick and thin. They've been there for years. They're going to be the ones there in the future. These owners who use it as a bit of fun and a bit of a bit of a laugh and a joke just just come and it's go a, and, a, and leave leave things in a mess. It's, it's a toy to some of them. It's it's yeah. a, it's a hobby, and mm -hmm. they don't realise what they're playing with. I read that Wigan was it fifty plus staff were made redundant on yeah. the back of it. People that have been there years. You know, it's yeah. it's actually it's disgraceful what happens and the. I think that from my point of view, knowing having been at a club where a takeover has gone through, um, if if the people coming in don't have the best interest of the club at heart, don't have the money that can support the club, then they shouldn't be allowed to. Yeah, I, to I totally agree because I, I look at Wigan and, and, and especially Sai, si, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, the time when I was at Cardiff in uh, probably, what, 2001, 2002, up to 2004, the, the Cardiff were all main uh, Cardiff and Wigan main rivals. Um, every time I went to the JJB, it was it was it was always a nice club to go to. You get a, a decent reception by by everybody at the whole club. Um, Dave Whelan was a chairman. 
uh, and he passed it down to his one of his sons uh, who, who who ended up selling it on when um, when they'd had enough, which is which is fine, and you, you're allowed to do that. But mm-hmm. it's like you say, it's got to be it's got to be handed over to the right people, and um, and that club is now just it's just it's a laughing stock, unfortunately. You know what I mean? It's a really good club as well, family club, and um, and it's just such a shame that it's it's getting neg- ne- negative publicity um, through all this stupidity by, by whoever whoever's whoever's bought the club. So Rhys David, uh, Rhys David Evans mm. just said there. It was reported today that the Wigan owner asked about administration the day before he bought the club. That is an absolute disgrace. Um, so he, you know, he had he had that in mind from that the moment he went in to clear the debts and to to make sure that he didn't he wasn't going to be liable for the debts in full. Which yeah. I I understand is is legal and all those things. It's not very ethical, and to me, surely that should be something which is picked up on. If the newspapers know about it, why wasn't that picked up on in the fit and proper tests or whatever it's called? I agree. It's, I, it's sorry, listen, I think I think the tests aren't um, as durable as they can be. I don't think they're as accurate as they can be, and it's the it's the longevity of a club which is getting let down. And like I go back to there, you know, what I mean, we've all we've all got our our, our teams, and you know what I mean. And luckily enough, a lot of us are. Uh, I've got a good chairman in place, and um, you know what I mean. I'll, I'll I'll use Steve Gibson as a as an example. Steve's at Middlesbrough, and um, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He's put X amount of money in the club, and you know what I mean. He could have easily sold on to somebody else and 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 made money or at, at the right time or or stop the money leaving his bank account on a monthly basis. And you know what I mean. These these people are fans and do it do it the right way. Whereas other clubs, like Robbie just said, there that they're, they're a toy to some people and. And a little bit of fun and a laugh and a joke, and but it's not a laugh and a joke to a football fan who's who's paying the money week in week out, travelling home and away, spending the next amount of money, and and getting let down by the owners. And you know what I mean? It's not the players who are letting the clubs down sometimes, and it's uh, it's the people above them. Yes, indeed. Uh, so next up, and we had the the your thing about the sn- snooker snooker final. Yeah, this annoyed me. This this really annoyed me. You know, I I, I don't mind a bit of snooker, I, I, and and to be honest, it doesn't bother me watching a game of snooker without any fans there because. Um, the atmosphere is probably exactly the same, so it doesn't really doesn't really have an impact. But when I when I saw when I saw fans there and heard that there was three hundred plus people there and they didn't have to social distance and they didn't have to wear a mask, so why aren't people allowed to go and watch football? Why aren't people allowed to go and watch grassroots football, um, support the local team and and just get a little bit of money back through the gate of, of uh, you know what I mean of, of your local team because. I'm not on about the big sides here who don't need the money and they're still getting money from Sky or they're still getting money through, through shirt sales and stuff. But I know for a fact non-league football, for example, um, started pre-season games at the weekend and they weren't allowed any supporters in whatsoever and they rely on money. And if Do you know what's it, stupid about that, that mate? Is, in my opinion, non-league clubs, uh, some of them, or most of them probably, are more equipped to have fans in there and then be social distanced in many ways than big clubs are because they don't have huge crowds anyway. I totally agree. You can space people out around around the place. Obviously, if you start getting football fans from other clubs who are coming to because they need a football fix, then you might have a problem. But if it's your regular crowds, it's, it's easily done, mate. And I yeah. think... Mate, use your common sense. You, you, use your yeah. common sense. If if somebody stood next to you, what you do? You can walk away and go and stand 10 metres away from them. If, if you sat next to somebody at the snooker, can you move away from them? You're stuck there all day. You know what I mean? Yeah, let's be honest. You're, you're stuck there for 35 frames. It's just, it's never ending. It's just, so it, it really is. Were there social distance in the snooker cams or, or were there? They didn't need to be, you know. So I think the, the area is not that big, is it, the Crucible? And because it was only, you know what I mean? Only, it's, only, it's only in the half at the minute, isn't it? Because they obviously shut off the half. So yeah, there was, there was 300 plus people. There wasn't social distancing right, okay. for everybody. Some people were, some people weren't. And, you know, I mean, everyone wants to go and watch Ronnie O'Sullivan in the final. I get that. I totally get that because he's an absolute legend. He's a hero, and he wants the crowd there, and everybody wants the crowd there. But I also think that sports got to be treat equal and treat the same. And if that's rugby, football, golf, whatever it may be, tennis, you know, what I mean, there's there's ways and means yeah. of doing things. And just be fair. That's all I want. I, I, I suppose. Yeah. No, I agree. Everything has to be fair. I suppose playing devil's advocate, it, it, it probably is one of the easiest sports to designate somebody to say, you're sitting there. Yeah. And if it's if it's one of these testing events that gets somewhere back to getting supporters into football stadiums... Yeah, I'm all for it. I'm all for it then. I'm all for it if that's, if that's what it is. I think, they had, I think they had a cricket game. I think it was a county cricket match where they allowed a thousand in. But there had yeah. to be social distance around. And yeah. if that gets us to a place where... 
we can get supporters into football mm. stadiums and we have to go through that testing to get it, then yeah. but I agree with you. If it's if yeah. it's not fair, then you know, you need to look at it. Well, listen, I, I can't wait for the day that they let some people back into football. And listen, everyone's not going to be happy. We're still, we're still going to have people coming on here and, and saying that they can't get to go in because they haven't been selected or someone else has got their... Uh, listen, you know what I mean? Someone's going to be unlucky and someone's going to be upset about it. But end of the day, it's about getting some people back in safely into football games. And if you've got to wait four games to watch a game, then so be it. You might, get, you might not get a very good game, but at least you're there watching a game and... For me, you know what I mean. It's better than it's better than not watching a game all season and watching it on TV because it's um, it's nice to watch games on TV with crowd, without crowd. I tried everything, but for me, I need to watch the fans back in because I'm a I'm a big advocate of when when the centre forward scores a goal, he goes and celebrates with his fans or against yeah. opposition, and I, I like that. I'm all for it. Well, well listen, Richie, the take up to, sorry, I'd say from the ahead, financial okay. aspect of that, sports nothing without the supporters. Yeah, Nothing. I totally agree, mate. I totally agree. And I was, uh, you know. Rob, Rob, I was a big, um, I was, I was, I was against, I was against football starting because of that, um, because of that, because I just wanted, I wanted football back as normal as it was. I wanted football back um, with all fans there, but in hindsight now, you know what I mean. It had to come back because I, I don't see, I don't see a, a quick fix still. Um, and you know, would we have just cancelled the season? Wouldn't have been fair. Uh, for everybody. No, it should have cancelled it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Richie says there, none of this makes sense at all. You can go to the beaches, you can go to pubs, you can go to the supermarket, but you can't go and watch an outdoor sport, an event, rugby, football. You can go and watch cricket to a certain extent. Um, this politicians, no common sense. A nice common sense, which is the word you just, you know, you've just said there, and it's it's down to people's common sense. And it to me, it seems like the people making the decisions don't, think football fans have enough common sense to social distance, which I think is massively disrespectful. No, it's just, but but it's, it's not it's surprising like, though, mate, when no, you think how football fans are treated by mm. you know, by the police, by the governing bodies, they're always treated pretty badly. But I think but I think so though I think though, could we not you know, I, I don't surprised. know what you guys think of it, could we not select a league to to try it out if that's uh, a semi professional league or and because whatever league it's going to be, whatever game it's going to be, people are going to want to go to it because they'll have missed going to that game and having that live occasion. So, you know what I mean? For me, we need to try it sooner rather than later. You know what I mean? Other countries yeah. have tried it. I'm sure Australia had um, some fans in. Other countries, Sweden, I think, have had some fans in. Scandinavia have had some fans in. So, um, for me, just give it a go and see what happens. If, if it doesn't work, then... Or we have a spike, then just scan it again and we, just, we, we go back to square one and we start again. Yeah, yeah so it's going to be just it's just going to be home supporters, isn't it? You can see that happening. Yeah. You know, people yeah. travelling won't be allowed. And, yeah. But no, the sooner that we're we're allowed back in to watch any sport, really, I know it's mm. football, we're all passionate about that, but the better. Rob, you've uh, you've played, you've played, and you've managed. You know, what I mean, how how important are fans then? You know, because um, I, I also read a story. I don't know how much truth in it, by the way, so don't shoot me down. But I read that if fans are allowed back, they're not allowed to. Um, sing songs they're not allowed to so, yeah uh, that's true that is, um, is that true in uh, what was it in there's um, so some wrestling in Japan and the U US has got a small amount of fans but they're only allowed in if they wear masks and they're not allowed to shout chant sing and um, <laughs> I've, I've heard that that's the same <laughs> football what's about to go in what's about to go what are you going to do but how, so <laughs> I, I, got my, I got my point then Rob so how, how important are football fans then you know what I mean? For in your career as a player and as a coach and a manager, how how influential? Well, are you? Yeah, that's, like you say, take away the financial aspects of them bringing revenue into the football club to help teams survive. Um, you feed off them. You feed off them. It's it can be a massive advantage. I would I would also say that I mean there was lots of studies under that the when the German league kicked off and certainly some of the Premier League games and Championship, but teams found it really difficult to win games at home. It seemed to be the away teams were, were winning more than yeah. the normal amount of games. So it shows you that if you've got that backing from support, it doesn't matter how, how big it is. Um, everybody goes to the three o'clock kickoff and they've got all the best aspirations. Our team's going to win today. Hmm. And if you get off to a good start, it, could be, it, it literally can push you over the line. On the flip side of that, I have been in stadiums where, um, let's, 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 let's be frank, the, the stadium like when we weren't doing very well. And the fans could turn, and you could see players actually physically shrink in front of them as well. So it can work both ways. So even as an away player, you knew that if you could keep it quiet, we played in games, and you go 
big derby games or you know teams having a difficult time and you think well do you know what if we can keep it tight 10 15 minutes this crowd's going to turn on them and it actually yeah. helps the away team so it can have a massive momentum switch depending on how the game's going but then you can also see from the other side of the coin and i, and I said this a couple of weeks ago that um I looked at the football and it reminded me a little bit of playing a reserve game that you've got to generate your own enthusiasm. You've got to get yourself up for the game, which is difficult for some players. You know, some players um, rely on the crowd to get you going and, and respond to that um, enthusiasm from other people. And it, yeah, well, as a centre forward, you you, you you want that noise when the when the ball hits the net. You want to celebrate with somebody. It must be a, it must be a so, such a strange feeling for. Um, I use Harland. I watched the first game when uh, when he scored the first goal for Borussia Dortmund against Schalke and. You know what I mean? The, the, the picture's a surreal picture that he's celebrating in front of nobody, but it must have been a very strange feeling for him and for everybody else who's done it. It's like a practice game, but with three points at the end of it. Yeah, with something at stake. And, and listen, and we've all, you know what I mean? Everyone who's played football, who's played reserve, reserve team games, that yes, you're disappointed that you haven't won, but it's not the be all and end all. It's not, it's not as heartbreaking no. as it is when there's proper points at stake when, you've, when, you, when, you, when you're playing a proper game. So it's, it's about fitness, it's about something else. You pick the positives out of it and. It must be a, such a strange feeling sometimes to go into a game thinking that you might get relegated today, or you know, it must have been a must have been quite strange for certain players. I, I, I do, I do, I do, I do wonder um, what differences it would have had if the crowds had been there. Who would have stayed up in the Premier League, for example? Would the would the Championship have been any different? Would would Leeds United have crumbled? You know what I mean? Because their fans are quite high demand. You just never know, do you? No, I'd like to say it affects different teams in different ways. You look at, if you, if you say the Premier League, you look at Bournemouth, they had a terrible run. But playing at Bournemouth, it's a real tight atmosphere, the crowd are right on top of you. Would, would it have helped them? And then you look at Southampton, yeah. they did fantastic after lockdown. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think there's a definitive answer, but it certainly did seem to have an advantage for one team or one club than, than others. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, right, moving on. Uh, something that I won't uh, won't want to talk about. Um, and I want to I want to throw out there about uh, the demise of British clubs in Europe because uh, obviously watched uh, Man City against uh, against Leon and I thought the tactics were all wrong. I thought their attitude was all wrong going into the game. Uh, watched United yesterday. Yes, they were better. They were miles miles better than the opponents, but they lost the game. Um, what's gone wrong this year, or what's gone wrong in general with British football, as in uh, in Europe? Because I. I, I I'll, I'll, say, I'll show you the, say the positive because I watched Wolves this year and I was massively impressed with them but they were always going to hit a level where they were going to come up, up across a, a decent side and if that's another British team or a Seville like they got beat by in the last minute then so be it but you know I mean has has something gone massively wrong in Europe Rob? I think I think that's probably a couple of points for me on that one I think no matter how you look at it it's been a bizarre season mm. you know with, with lockdown I think I mean, you've got to take that into account at some stretch. Now, everybody else has had the same thing, you could argue, and I, I completely get that point. Um, if you just take Man City, you and I, you talk about fine margins in the game, and I agree with you, I, I, and listen, it's not for me or you to criticise Pep Guardiola. Oh, no, I never would, no. But for me, but I think he did get it wrong. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's the opinion. You watched him against Real Madrid a couple of weeks before, and I thought they were unbelievable. I got it right, you know, so for him to change so dr- dramatically was a strange decision. Now if Sterling knocks that ball in from four yards to make it two two, it could be a completely different game, couldn't it? Yeah. yeah so yeah. these are the five margins I'm talking about. I think I think on any given day, I still think these teams that we've got challenge the best teams in Europe. I've got no doubt about that. It was only a couple of, last year, but you had two teams in the final of the Champions League. You've gone. You know, two teams in the chat, the final of the Europa League. I think this year it's just not that. I just don't think it's quite happened. And like I say, it's fine margins. Liverpool probably don't want to say took their eye off it, but the, the, the Premier League was all they were focused on. But they played against Atletico Madrid. They knock them out. Yeah. They're a top team. It's yeah. not, there's no given right for them to to just turn up and beat Atletico Madrid the way they play. Mm. Um, so demise is probably for me a little bit strong. What you would like to see next year is on the back of probably a normal season, yeah. teams getting to three finals and finals again. Yeah, well, I th- and I think that's what you know. We, we none of us want to see a, an all England semi final in the Champions League, but at the same time, we're then guaranteed somebody in the final. So I'm, you know, what I mean, the the, the the better teams can progress through to the later rounds and later stages, the better chance we've got to have more teams competing. We've got the better players coming to the Premier League instead of them going. Staying in Italy, going over to Spain, you know that. Um, 
yeah, we're gonna we're, we're gonna hit uh, a conversation in a minute about Barcelona. So you know, I mean, I want I want I want Messi to come to England because I want to see him against the best players in the world. In my opinion, I want to come and see him uh, and be able to go and watch him live um, at a stadium and see him on TV week in week out. And this can only happen for me if if teams are really competing well, keep competing well in the best in Europe because he's. He's desperate for the Champions League. He's, he's he always has been. He always will be, and um, and he sees. I think the Champions League is probably a, a higher standard than any any league any league in the world, really. So he will probably want to go to the best team who's got the best chance to win the the Champions League um, season on season, and um, and and where he wherever he decides and wherever he thinks it is, he will go. But um, but we'll move on to that one then. So um, I put something on social media the other day, and uh, a few people backed me. A few people shot me down. Oh, try to shoot me down. Doesn't happen. Um, but um, I said, is it the end for Barcelona? In my opinion, I look at the age factor. I look at um, Iniesta, Xavi um, packing in. Um, that that was a big one. Busquets more of a squad player than a um, than a regular. Uh, those are the factors for me. And I'm not on about this season. I'm on about an accumulation of the last few seasons that um, that it's gone. Puyol, you know what I mean? Probably it's the spine of the team we're on about now. Um, and, and and for mm. me, it's going. You, 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 you can't you can't fault a message. You can't fault the fault of the Griezmanns and the Suarez and and the Rakitic, for example, all world class footballers. But you know what I mean. What do you think, Rob? Is it is it the end for Barcelona? Do you think they're going to lose a few players? I possibly. I think they'll be uh, almost like a recycling job. You know, if teams catch up to other teams. Maybe you, you, you look at Manchester United a few years ago. It's almost like they lost the fear factor the touch. And teams actually felt fancy the chances against them. Listen, Barcelona still got some amazing players. Oh yeah, but something. But you you read the comments from PK after the game the other night, and something's just not quite right there. Whether it's behind the scenes, so it's. I think it's a rebuild. Um, it's a, it's obviously a huge club with fantastic history. Um, Messi is brilliant, but I could see him being a problem as well in terms of. Um, the amount of say he has, probably coaches coming in, coaches going out. Um, he's that powerful because he's that good and he's, he's, he's been the best player in the world for, for a long time. Yeah. So, is it the end? I, listen, I don't think you say it's the end, but certainly there needs some investment in key areas. You, you mentioned the centre-backs there. Hoyle and PK were you, un, un, formidable, weren't they? You, you yeah. were getting around there. Us gets in front of them. Savvy and Iniesta, you talk about world-class players. And it's very difficult to replace so many of them at once. Mm. I totally so, agree. And I'm and I, I, sorry, Sai. Sorry, Sai. But I, 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 just before I came on, there was a story on Sky Sports that Ronald Koeman's going to be the new manager. Um, right. And um, it's a, it's a one-year one year appointment. Um, keeping the keeping the seat warm for, for Zabi taking over the following year. Yeah, so they're, it's the, they're, yeah. They're, they're planning for the long term. So for, when I say, um, is it the end for Barcelona? I do believe it is the end for Barcelona now. And... They re- they rebuild next year when they're ready. You know what I mean? But that is is that's two years down the line for Suarez. Won't be there probably. He's going to be he'll probably be probably be moving on. Um, Griezmann, dependent on fitness um, ages again. Will Messi move come back? Will he stay and sit put and, and hope that things work out the next next year or two? It's going to be difficult. Robbie mentioned there earlier on about Man City against Real Madrid. Real Madrid will love nothing better than put the final nail in the coffin for Barcelona yeah. for the next couple of seasons and make sure they win the league. So, and what a couple of things I wanted to circle back to. You said um, you can't fault uh, Messi, Suarez, Griezmann, them lot. I think you can because I think they've let them down. They they they've let them down in big games this year in the league and in Europe. And I think you know when you look at those players, yes, they are some of the best players who've played the game in the last ten years. However, are they you know in Messi, Suarez? Are they coming towards this kind of not saying they're you know on the out, but they're, they're coming to the downward sort of slope towards the end of their career. Now, they're talking of selling Dembele, potentially, uh, and Suarez. We talked about on Friday, they'd be linked to Ronaldo. In my opinion, if they sign Ronaldo, for instance, I think that's a massive backward step. Now, of course, he'll probably go and have a fantastic season because he's a fantastic player if he was to go there. But... What they need is reinvestment in the right areas. Um, they they lack pace, and they lack a bit of youth and ingenuity, which is remarkable to say when you look at the squad they've got. 
and I just think signing a if they were genuinely looking at him, obviously it's rumours, but if you're genuinely looking at a 35 or whatever he is, 33, 34-year-old Ronaldo as the saviour, when you've already got Messi of around about the same age, I'm not sure that's a... That's, like we talked about with Middlesbrough, like planning for the future by bringing in... Yeah, uh, comparing, Warnock, like, comparing Middlesbrough to, uh, Middlesbrough to uh, Barcelona. No, but I mean the same the same thought process, isn't it? It's, the <laughs> nah, I totally agree. it's nah, short totally agree. term, short term yeah, thinking, nah. mate, isn't it? Anyway, it's, it's short term mentality, and I, 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 I'll be interested to see what Robbie thinks now. But you just mentioned there about young lads. How do you feel as a young lad at Barcelona if you're seeing 35 year olds being brought in and you're not given an opportunity? How did Messi get a chance? How did how did all the young boys get a chance at Barcelona? They all They've got, got some awesome play. youth players, mate, as well. They've got, got some I, incredible young players. They go out on loan to go to, to go and play in La Liga. Um, they come over to England. They come over to uh, go over to, to Italy. You know, mate, if they're gonna uh, listen, you, you say, I, I didn't mean I can't fault them. I, I can't defend him what happened on um, on Thursday night or whatever night it was against uh, against Bayern Munich. It's not the first they, time this season they've done they that. They down basically. tools, they down tools, and they give up. And that was that was a that was that was heartbreaking to watch um, from a. I think from a coach's and manager's point of view, if that's your if that's your team out on the field, you must be absolutely heartbroken, Rob. How would you? How would you? How can you justify what happened there then, as a as a coach or a manager standing watching that? Well, you can't really. I mean, I was watching that game and the coach looked lost. You know, he's, it's almost like something's happening in front of him and he's got no control over it. Exactly what you said. I thought the players were, were, were a disgrace. You know, let's let's have it right. So, there's no team at that level should be getting beat by that much. But it looked, it did look that it was the end of a cycle of, of players, so mm. to speak. Um, you, you, you look at Messi, he's done everything there, hasn't he? He's done yeah. absolutely everything there. Mm. Has he still got the hunger to keep keep doing it? Um, Suarez. Well, th- th- listen. We, we t- I remember that team of Barcelona with Xavi. When they came through, they came through La Masia, isn't it? And sort of came through the youth system and Barcelona B. Now I'd be interested to see what players they have now coming through that. So if it's a year for Kuman before Xavi comes in, can these players get blooded next year as this? Um, sabbatical if you like before Zabi comes in and give him a year's experience before the main man that really wants to be in charge comes in so in, on, their first, well. in their first team squad right I'm going to just name some of the players who are 28 or under um, you've got the keeper Stegen he's under he's 28 then you've got um, Samuel Mtiti is 26 you've got uh, where's he gone Jordi Alba's 31, you've got Firpo, Miranda, 20, Semedo, 26. Uh, where's he gone? There's a couple of others. Fernandez, 22. Frankie de Jong, 23. Arthur, 24. Um, there was another one as well. Some of those players have been signed for big money, by the way. Frankie hmm? de Jong was signed for 64.8 million. Dembele, 23. Uh, obviously, they've got the, the, the Colossus, that is Martin Braithwaite up front. <laughs> who they desperately needed to sign, didn't they, in the in that emergency signing? But Sam, uh, these players also have to play week oh. in week out to develop and play any better. These got to play, and if you've got, and I'm, I'm, I'll go back to me, me me point, if you've got a lad who's 32, 33, 34 year old playing ahead of you, how do you feel when you're being bought for big money? You know, what I mean, you you you've signed there to oust those kind of players, thinking you're the next generation, you're the next level, and you've got more energy than you, you're probably fitter than them. Yes, you might not have the reputation that other people have got. But you've got the you've got the ability because you you're a Barcelona player. Well, here's one, mate. Uh, Ansu F- Ansu Fati. I might Fati, not be pronouncing yeah. his right. Uh, he's 17 years old. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, he was he's worth 45 million or they signed him for 45 million. I think came, sure to the youth, he came to the youth. Came to the youth. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But how's he gonna feel if they sign Ronaldo? Seriously, like. Well, how did he how did he feel when they signed um, Gries, Griezmann? Griezmann. Um, Dembele. Everybody, yeah. You know, I mean, how does he feel when when he's not playing? You know, what I mean, when he, when he he was watching the game on the on the touchline because he was sub the other night, he must have been watching that, thinking he was itching to get on, coming to get on. And then when he comes on, it was the worst possible time because, like Robbie said, the players it was a disgrace, the down tools, they might as well just not have bothered in it. But it affects people like that. You know, what I mean, you see some of the subs on the touchline kicking chairs and throwing bottles around, and because can, can I just make a point on those players? And you're right to say, obviously, they've got to be talented players. I, I would also throw back at that. If they were that talented, they'd be playing. No manager doesn't pick the team that he thinks should should win the game. But are they and not also, taking a risk on them because 
they're, there's so much pressure on them to win that possibly so which might, see what I mean yeah which might be why Kuman's been brought in for this year if that's true but we, t- we spoke about the question before was about the demise of the British clubs in Europe mm. players that you just mentioned would they get in Liverpool's team now would I they get in Man City's them, Mike? No, I, 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 I disagree. I, I don't think they would. So you know what I mean. I, yeah, I, you know what I mean. You, you, you're looking at you, 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 you play your best teams, don't you? You play. You, I agree with Robbie there. You know what I mean. As a coach and a manager's point of view, you know, he hasn't got into that game wanting to lose and wanting to. Oh, to of not course not. And, team, so. and listen, and these clubs are very political as well. You know, that's right. There's certain players that I probably imagine that he has to play, otherwise he gets to play straight away. Um, that happens. But but, but my point is because. And I'm not talking about Suarez and Messi because we've seen them over a period of time be world class. But the players that that Sai just mentioned there, obviously really good players, but I'm not putting them in Liverpool's team. I'm not sure I'm putting them in Man City's team. Hey, Mike, just looking at the Man City's team. Bayern Munich's team. You know, these top teams in in Europe, Bayern, uh, maybe Juventus, PSG, these players, just because they've got Barcelona next to the name, and the brilliant yeah. players, don't get me wrong, are they world class as what Zabi was, Iniesta was, Busquets was, Oyel? But they developed into being world world class because Barcelona put them in the first team and played them 30 games a season. So when they were 18, 19, they had numerous amounts of games at the top level under their belt. Now, yeah. like going back to my original point, Barcelona are looking at someone like Ronaldo, who's ready made, you know, going to score you 30 goals in a season, blah, blah, blah. But that's not going to develop any of those players. Like, yes, they'll improve from training with him every day. But from a playing point of view, they've got to play, haven't they, to, 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 to develop yeah. into those world-class players. I'm completely with you. I'd be amazed if Ronaldo went there. Yeah, I'd be yeah I don't think he will either. Yeah, you know, I, I just think that's rumours. Paper, and... paper talk, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, don't, don't quote me on this. Don't clip that bit for when Ronaldo's got a bad score. <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely <laughs> <I> well. <will. laughs> He's never going there, I'm telling you. He reads you like, he reads you like a book here, doesn't he? He reads you like a book. Yeah, he knows it's coming. <laughs> um, um, right, so we've got one more bit of uh, any other business before we move on to Robbie's, um, Robbie's yes. super career. What, what is it? You tell everybody. So, um, yeah, so a couple of people asked for our opinion on uh, Kiefer Moore to Cardiff City and also um, Lyle Taylor to Nottingham Forest. So, um, go on, Andrew, you go first with the, those and then I'll give my opinion because my opinion is um, ne- negative. Uh, well, I think everybody on the show, everybody in the country knows my opinion on Lyle Taylor, knows how uh, negative I, I have been on him, uh, that he didn't play and didn't finish the season for Charlton, and Charlton have retrospectively got himself relegated. Um, I see it as a, I don't see it as a massive step up. For me, he should have got in the Premier League. He would have been best off going into Scotland to go and play for uh, Celtic or Rangers, which the rumour was that he was, he was already going to go there. Uh, do I see Nottingham Forest side um, and Robbie? Do I see Nottingham Forest winning the league next year? No, I don't. Do I see them um, after the season they've had? It's going to be a difficult one. Um, do I see him taking Lewis Grabman out of the team? No, I don't. You know what I mean? Are they going to play together? It'll be interesting if they do, if they can form a partnership. But it's it's a big ask. You know, he's, he's gone there. He's obviously picking up good money. He's gone to further his career, which is good luck to him. Uh, but for me, I don't see it as a massive step forward. I would have liked to see him in the Premier League to see if he could have cut it at a West Ham, at a Villa, Brighton something but I don't see it as a massive step up well mate I look at the way Cardiff City played since the lockdown finished and I look at those two strikers who one's gone to Forest one's gone to Cardiff I do not see the logic in Cardiff signing Kiefer Moore because he is no better than Glatzel if anything I think Glatzel is a better finisher and better in his all round play build up play um, Kiefer Moore has done amazing for Wales but I think I could do amazing for Wales with Ramsey, Bale, Daniel James, you know, putting the balls in the box for me and yeah. playing me through. Um, Lyle Taylor to Forest, to me, I just think, what was the point? What was the point in alienating a club which you've done so well for? Just for a very, to me, it's quite a sideways move. I would have liked to have seen Cardiff go after Lyle Taylor, whether they did or they didn't. You know, Obviously, I don't know that, but he would have suited more with what we need. I don't think we need Kiefer Moore. Um, and that's no disrespect to him. I'll support him. But... Now, listen, say si, I'll, I'll always back Neil about what he does because uh, because he's, he's, he's done really well since he's come in. I think my, my negative look on it is is 
is the way it's going to be one or the other. He's not going to play them both together. Um, so the formation is going to stay the same. He's going to play one up. He's going to probably going to play Tomlin behind the two wide. And I, w- I want to see more people in the box. I want to see Cardiff score more goals. And do I see them doing it with one man up front? The, the delivery is going to have to be spot on for um, for that to happen. And you know, I mean, you just said there he's getting the supply from uh, Ramsey, from Daniel James, from Gareth Bale. No disrespect to Cardiff, he isn't going to get that kind of uh, delivery week in, week out. So, is he going to score well, as many go. goals? Possibly not. There you go. Like Reese says there, uh, when Cardiff play with a, ta- a target man, which you know, Kiefer Moore is a target man. It means Tomlin isn't as effective as a number ten, which is where all Cardiff's creativity comes from. Um, and he needs you know pace ahead of him. Danny Ward's obviously gone. My point being as well is. Um, Cardiff City have played, actually play. I've enjoyed watching Cardiff the last few months for the first time in a while from a footballing point of view. And now it feels like they're kind of going to go backwards towards playing more direct football. Um, Rob, what's, uh, interesting to see. What, Rob, what's, yeah. your, what's your thoughts on um, one style of play? Is, is, is a club or a, or a team or a manager got to be flexible and have, have different types of, of playing or is one dimensional function play? Is that. Is that the way to do it? Is that the way forward? I think you've always got a plan here, haven't you? And if you, if you look at what Neil's doing now, I think I think Mill's a good signing. Whether whether he's as good as the player that you've got or, or not as good, but I think it gives him options that he can mix and match it. It probably adds as well adds competition to that position. You might see on, on, an increase. On that point, in... on that point, Rob, he did need a centre forward in because he got rid of Jamie Ward, so he did need a body in. But I mean, for me, was yeah. it the right body? That's the that's the question everyone but, wants to know. But you, you also don't know. You might be going in for somebody else that's a different type, so you can play one or the other. You know, if Keith Moore scores you twenty goals coming off the bench, mm. then you'd be well happy because you'd be getting promoted. You can't yeah, have too many. You can't have too many centre forwards. Is he a similar type? I'd argue that he probably is. But at the same time, you can't have too many of them. The Lyle so Taylor I, one is interesting for me. Yeah. So I'm with you, yeah. Cams. I, 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 yeah. I think so the way went, he went uh, about his business. When uh, was when was the last time that me and you slagged Neil Harris off? Yeah, not since the first time he came in. Oh, the Legion United game for his, yeah. for his, uh, So we had a we did a live show, Rob, uh, an hour before the right. the first lockdown lockdown game against Leeds. We we slagged his team selection off. We <laughs> slagged his formation off. Um, Cardiff pulled off one of the best performances um, of the season. Basically, yeah. they did. I did. I got two very good goals and and shut us up. And ever since that, Neil's just slammed it down our throats. I got it. I do I want to clarify something. I love. Um, because a couple of people have said, like, give him a chance and stuff. I'm not criticising Kiefer Moore. I think he does offer Cardiff certain things. And, of course, I, you know, as a fan, I will support him and I'll get behind him. My point is, Cardiff needed a forward. They didn't. Of, a, of the forwards they needed, they didn't need a target man. They've already got a target man. What they needed was pace and someone who's going to score goals. Now, to me, when I look at those two signings specifically... I would have rather Lyle Taylor, you know, attitude aside, which is questionable by the seems seems to be. Um, I'm just I'm a bit disappointed. I think that's that's the best way to say it. I'm good. I I do enjoy when Cardiff sign a you know a Welshman and stuff, but I'm disappointed. No, you, no, you don't. Because you, you enjoy you enjoy when they sign the Englishman. Yeah, like well, me. Like me. What we need is a proper goal scorer, someone who's fast, like a speed demon. Fox in the box, a goal collector like Michael Chopra. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, oh, I, there was something, something else. Sorry, I just uh, so much. Someone just said something. Go, just going to circle back really quickly to the Barcelona discussion. Uh, someone made a point is uh, so Arthur, which was one of the young players who I mentioned who hasn't really had too much of a chance, is going to Juve apparently, and in return they're having uh, Pjanic come in from Juve, who's thirty. So, and he's been poor for the last couple of years as well. So that kind of, to me, goes on to what I, what we were discussing about short-term thinking. They're getting rid of a young, potentially quality midfielder to bring in someone who's got a name who's coming to the, towards the end or the latter part of their career. Interesting that they've changed or they're going down that route, should we say. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, Richard, it's a di- sorry, it's a different setup as well. After after not got a, um, a vote for a new president as well, and yeah, also, next year, you know, it's, it's yeah, next year, these clubs, it's very very political how how the run really is. Yeah. 
Um, right, let's move on, Rob. So I think it's uh, it's fitting timing. Obviously, talking about Barcelona and then moving uh, straight into your career because um, <laughs> obviously we um, we crossed paths very early. We grew up, we grew up, uh, grew up together, uh, played played together. So you tell everybody, tell everybody how your how your career started. Obviously, you were. You were born uh, and brought up in the northeast. Um, so tell everybody when you started playing and who you started playing football for. I mean, like, like most young kids growing up, our, our age counts. I was, I was playing football from as early as I can remember. You know, kicking the ball about in the garden, joining primary school football teams, joining your Sunday league football teams, um, and then um, you know you. you you get picked by by scouts at sort of seven, eight, nine years old. You get asked to go train at Middlesbrough at Essen Park, which was obviously my club. Um, and it sort of develops from there, doesn't it? You, you know, you, you you go through the age groups. I was always I was always okay as a player, and I always played a couple of years up at an uh, age groups, which was a massive help for me. Um, when you say that, Rob, how, how influential was that then? Because um, how does that how does that help your development or a player's development? Because you see a lot of people doing it now that they play a year or two above themselves. What 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 does that mean for people who don't know? And uh, what does it entail? Or what 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 to feel like? Yeah. So, for example, so when I was eleven years old, I was playing in the under thirteens league. Um, you know, I found the under elevens league too easy for want of a better word you'd still play in your own age groups for district at times and county but you know if people see a, um, a strength in you either technically or physically and you move up so it becomes more of a challenge um we've used that obviously my background in coaching started in the, the the academies as well we do that still you know we see people with talent people that have maybe physically progressed quicker than other players at their age group. You bump them up a, an age group to see that challenge, uh, see if they can cope with that. Um, and it works the other way as well. You we can, we can yeah. drop players down at that, at that age uh, in the academies. Um, but no, I just sort of played for, for all the local teams. Um, we had a really strong team. People like Anthony Omrod was in my team. who was a year old, you know, well. And, yeah. um, we, you know, we sort of played in a, a really competitive Teesside Junior Football Alliance league against yourselves at Martin and places like that and it was just like a hotbed the academy system hadn't really kicked off did it we, we were training no, maybe no, twice no. played on a Saturday morning at times but you're still playing so all the, all the academy players were still playing on a Sunday it's the actual well, I think I think I think, really I think that's how strong the league one was Rob though wasn't it you know what I mean because you could guarantee every game that we had um, we had yourselves um, we had Borough Rangers we had Martin you had Nunthorpe you had all these kind of teams um, it would be really strong week in, week out. So every league game, every cup game would be a strong game. You'd end up playing for your well, district, wasn't it? So I think we played together. Did we play together? Was it Langbar? Because I, I went to school. Yeah, it would be Langbar, yeah. I, I went to school at Lunthorpe, which in, at the mm. time was in a, it was North Yorkshire or whatever it was. And we, obviously we played against Middlesbrough and things. And we travelled all over the country playing for that. And it was in, really enjoyable. We had a strong, really strong group. Um, one thing you just you mentioned there, you mentioned scouts and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Middlesbrough. Um, and there's there's, a, there's 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 two people who, who spring to mind straight away from me. So, um, how influential uh, were the people at Middlesbrough in 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 your upbringing, your development, um, your um, your love for um, for the football when you were younger, really? And I'll start with uh, I'll start with Ron Bourne because I know Ron's watching, by the way, because um, I've had a bit of contact with uh, with Ron's son Graham. So, uh, if you're watching, Ron, uh, keep watching, mate. Love it. Uh, thanks for everything you've done for me. Uh, but Robbie, so how influential was uh, was Ron to you? Well, say hi, Ron. Um, appreciate Ron saying he was the be- I was the best player he's ever scouted as well. So, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, I- I like, uh, Ron was a huge figure at the club, wasn't he? Um, yeah. It, you know, I, I, so many of us owe massive gra- that gratitude to him. Um, just basically, for anybody who doesn't know, Ron was scouting was based on youth development officer he was all sorts wasn't he at the time um but then the influence that the coaches have on you as well so coming through the system you have lots of different coaches um we train twice a week i said a tuesday night and a first night at Ayrson park in the old gym people like dave geddes ray train kenny wharton stan nixon all fantastic coaches that have a big influence on you when, when you're growing up and you're young um and then there's, you know, there's, there's other people that were involved with Ron at the time, Keith Noble and 
and, and all these people that just their job was to try and get me to be a professional footballer and at that time speaking for myself I was obsessed on being a footballer absolutely mm. obsessed it was all I wanted to do it was out at seven in the morning before school school practicing it was coming home from school it was football share you used to love training uh, for any team I, I probably didn't have a night off from when I was training with somebody if I wasn't with a team or a club I'd be training on my own and I think uh, that obsession was the only way I was going to make it because there was there was more talented players than me I'm sure and we, yeah. we both played with them but they didn't have that drive that I had um, and then that's probably the, the, the biggest thing and the, the club recognised that so obviously in those times you could sign schoolboy forms at under 14 and then you get two year YTS on the back of leaving school um, but it's same, I'm sure same with you um, probably not as many as me but I had loads of clubs after me at 14 um, no, yeah, well, yeah, no, well, I was, uh, I was, I don't know, but I was really worried, Rob, to be honest. When I, um, I went, uh, obviously, I signed two years schoolboy at Middlesbrough. When I signed my schoolboy, um, a lot of the lads, like Anthomrod and and Swally and and a few of the other lads had already signed pro forms or what? Sorry, YTS forms and, and and some had signed pro forms as well. And you know what I mean? So there was there was only limited places as well back then. So the limited places, I think there was ten places up for grabs, and um, I think yeah. seven, seven, seven had already gone. So yeah. You, you're trying to grasp one of those little, uh, one of those little places um, out of 45 or six of us, and it was, it was a scary time because, like you say, you know, and I, I, the the word obsession for me, and I think that starts with Ron. It starts with Ron. Starts with Keith. Starts with Dave Geddes. Starts with all the coaches that you mentioned, and um, and the obsession for me is just it, they were driven with the appetite of bringing all those kind of players through because. The amount of players who's played probably for Middlesbrough first team, for England, for the country, for Scotland, you're like 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 you for other for other countries, Ireland, for example. The amount of players who we brought over from Ireland who made the made the first team debut, you know what I mean? There's a lot of people who wore uh, who wore the coaches and the staff at Middlesbrough. Uh, quite yeah, quite quite. quite I you know that it was uh, you know what I mean such a surreal time and. Um, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing it's an amazing talent for what they had to spot players. It's even. Harder talent to then develop them, and that's, that's what all. they excel at. I totally agree, and I think, um, and I think a lot of people come through the door, don't they? It's like a conveyor belt, and I, and I think the, the the longer, probably when YTS has left, and apprenticeships come in, um, I think that conveyor belt gets a, gets a little bit bigger, and um, then money starts to become involved. You know what I mean? Like I've said last week. Um, and we had this conversation side, didn't we, about uh, being a white DS was the happiest time of my football career. Uh, that loved it. I loved the long hours. I loved getting being first in, last out. I loved when Dave used to um, give us our thirty-seven pound fifty on a Friday, cash in hand, and he used to spend half of it by the time I got home. And there was no, there was no better days, you know. That it was, um, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, Robbie, I wanted to ask you a question. Kind of, um, obviously, you you've gone through the youth system yourself, and now you've obviously been a manager and assistant manager. Where do you stand on apprentices and academy players doing chores around the ground, cleaning pro, the pros' boots and getting the kit ready? You know, all this different stuff that years ago used to be done by the youth players and the apprentices, but these days don't really tend to be doing, being done. Well, we did it, Rob. Did we? Um, we did it. We, we did it. Um, I went, I first went, well, when I was at Grimsby as academy manager, they did it. The YTS players would do it. I thought it was a really important part of their learning responsibility. Uh, you wouldn't make them do cleaning the stands or anything anything like that, but certainly they had jobs and roles and responsibilities and exactly the same as the boys at Sunderland did, to be honest. Um, I know some clubs don't do it, and I think they're missing a trick. There was nothing... I mean, I remember being... A, you know, I was a goody two-shoes when Cam's left to, to be a pro, so I was second year YTS. He was, he was like... And, he um, was, he so was. I was I was sort of unofficial head head boy. But the, so that meant that you had to pack the boot skip. But the first thing on a Friday morning, if we were going away, I have never felt pressure like it. You know, ticking those boots off, making sure that, you know, the players had the right footwear and, and all the rest of it. So, oh, that's my lad, that Aussie stop there. Mm. <laughs> he's, obviously, he's obviously playing at Xbox we've crossed over um, so yeah I, I, I think it's an important part of growing up and you don't abuse the facts but certainly they need to take a responsibility so yeah there's still uh, that under 18s at Sunderland when I was there they're still clean the pros boots they're still responsible for their own equipment and it's part of that growing up um, why they, do you think that's changed now though why do you think clubs have stopped doing it 
I think some clubs are a little bit nervous. You know, times change, don't they? But I, I, you know, it's it's a case of if you believe in it for a specific reason, which I do. I do think it develops yeah. a, a young player and gives them roles and responsibilities. But some clubs don't. That's their prerogative. You know, Manchester City, for example, will be paying thousands of pounds a week to some of their wives or under 18s team, um, yeah. and it won't be on the agenda when signing this kid to say, listen, you're going to have to do that. You'll go, well, I'm not, you know, I'll go somewhere else. So there's, there's a little bit of that. Um, but like you say, it's, uh, I, I, I thought and still do believe it's a, it's a part of growing up. And it also keeps the players a little bit grounded. It keeps them level. I remember making my debut at 17 for Borough. And I think it was a midweek game. And the next Saturday, I was kit boy again for the first team on the Saturday afternoon. So straight away, any any idea you've got of getting above your station, you, you're straight back down to earth. And I think, obviously, you do this with Cams, who's, who's a great guy. I would imagine that the majority of lads who came through at the same time as us would be would say the same thing as Andy did. It, it was a great time in your life, the camaraderie, but also it, it taught you a lot of respect as well. I think that's I think that's key for me because you, you get young lads, don't you? You know what I mean? Like we we've all got we've all got kids. We've all got you know what I mean? Kids of a, of a probably. Uh, of, a, of a age now we were answering back um, you know what I mean teenagers so to speak you know what I mean yes I've got little ones as well but um, those those kind of I think respect issues uh, come more of apparent you know what I mean when when you, when you tell people to clean the room and stuff you know what I mean when we got told to clean changing rooms it, it wasn't a question of are you doing it you got told to do it if you didn't do it properly enough uh, somebody would come in and pour a bucket of dirty water all over it so you'd have to do it again and do it better you know what I mean that uh, jobs would get checked every Friday, proper um, by, by by Dave Geddes, the youth team manager. And it would it, it, listen. It would be it, it was a, it was an amazing thing, amazing thing. Robbie said there about being head boy. I wasn't lucky enough to be head boy, but I did pack the skip right. I packed the skip once with um, with Alex Smith, and I put um, I put boots in for Chris Morris, which I thought were Chris Morris's boots because I was his boot boy. I put the wrong boots in for him. He didn't have a very good game on the Saturday. He gave a couple of goals away, uh, and he came in and he told me on the Monday how. Rubbish I was. I, I, wasn't the be- I wasn't the best boot boy, by the way, in the world. I, I did probably just uh, brush over things when I, when I should have given him a little bit more, little bit more care and attention. But That's listen, why you were head boy, you see. Exactly. Mm. You know, I let myself down a little bit, but I, I loved it. I loved the, I loved the hours. I loved that the, the we were first in on the morning. We set everybody's kit up. We, um, we then came, watched the first team boys come in. They would train. We would train. The first team would, would come back in, have a shower, get changed. We would clean up, do jobs, go back out to train ourselves, come back in, sort ourselves out. And it would just be... And then we'd have well, a game at yeah. the end of it. It would be brilliant. It would be fantastic. I mean, people forget as well. And there'll still be close. And I know I go back to Grimsby, a great grounding in my coaching. But that reminded me very much of the first days of our YTS before we had the fantastic training ground down the road at Rockcliffe. We used to have to uh, get changed at the, the Riverside and jump on a minibus to Tolsby Road. Yeah. which was about 25 minutes away yeah, well, before yeah. the first team got there. And we had to open the, the, the container. We had to put the goals together with the nuts and bolts and put the nets on. And, mm. and you know, in the winter, your hands were freezing oh. cold. But, but it had to be done. There was it, no it, gloves, by the way, was there? There was no gloves, was there? It was all, uh, um, it was, yeah, it was no. brutal. brutal. It's a great, but, yeah, great... It, Great comment. Sorry to interrupt you there, uh, Robbie. Great comment there by um, Richard James Thomas Ho, uh, or Ho, sorry. Uh, uh, he said, I turned up for a trial with a proper ego and a massive chip on my shoulder, and I learned how small I actually was after my first session. It was a great experience and a good life lesson. Um, and another uh, comment we had was Gaz says, uh, with the chores thing, he thinks that the positives of doing chores outweighs the negatives for the I think young si, players. I, I think I think Robbie's word of and I'm gonna use it, it's gonna be the, the word of the night is gonna be obsession and it's the obsession because it wasn't just football by the way, because you've also got judged on, on how you performed during the day and through the day and if that was um doing jobs, if that was being professional, because you you weren't just judged on how you trained, it was about being an all round professional, young professional and how you handled yourself because there was a lot of banter flying around as well and a lot of comments both positive and negative and it's how you handled yourself because some young lads have seen crumble um and and when it comes to the training because we all trained with the first team at different times in our life or played with the reserves and and could you handle that pressure of being shouted at by an Nigel Pearson for example or a or a Mike Kelly who was uh, quite an outspoken figure at times as a goalkeeping coach you know that if you could handle all these things then the Viv Andersons and the Gordon McQueens and the, and the Gaffers who were just a 
they, they were a, for me a piece of cake because they were the ones who give you the praise and, 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 and the acknowledgement and all the good positive comments where if you could handle the negatives from, from, from certain people it was just a it was just the most enjoyable thing in the world and just loved every minute of it and and and, and would I would I if I could live live my life all over again would I do it again I'd do it again tomorrow it would just yeah. be It'd be a, it'd be a right lap, and would I do it any differently? I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't no. just do it exactly the same way I did. And go after Listen, Dave Jones on social time. media as well. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, that, times have changed, haven't they? Let's, let's be right. You know, some of the things that we go up to, you just couldn't get away with now. And um, Rob, you know, tell everybody about Christmas? um tell everybody about Christmas. What happened at Christmas? I was just at the Christmas show. <laughs> tell everybody about Christmas show. And and did you <laughs> did you ever lose? No, no, no. never lost. Um, what? What happened if you lost? Did you tell everybody what happened. No, well, what is it? What is it first? Okay, so the Christmas show was um, when, when I was there. It was um, you could pair up or get into little groups, and yeah, you, you had to knock. It was always before the first team had the Christmas party, so they were always in a very lively mood anyway. And as a group of YTS boys, sixteen to eighteen, absolutely, honestly, dreading it. Um, you had to knock on the first team door, the changing room door at the Riverside at, at, at the time. They were all armed with bottles of water, dirty slips, the full lot. So you knew you were going to get it as soon as you went in. And there was a little stage in the middle of the room. And bearing in mind, all the girls from the office would come down and watch it and all the rest of it. So it wasn't just the, the senior boys. And you had to do a, a skit. You had to do a song. You had to do a joke. You had to put on a performance. And I remember doing it with um, a little Irish lad one year. Do you remember Gary Burdock? Gary Burdock, yeah. Gaz, he's sort of, he's real, yeah, but a real big character. We were only tiny, so we went in as a um, we did Oasis, I think. We did, we did all the arms and the, the, the Gaz's pretend to chuck something at some at big Nige and all the rest. Anyway, we got away with it. Ultimately, what happens is the first team then choose the worst, and if you didn't do it, that was even worse than doing it. Being mm-hmm. crap, and um, it was Biffle, wasn't it? David Baker, was it that lost yeah. one year? Yeah, Biffle, yeah. And the fourth, the fourth it was. Am I allowed to say this? Because this might bring up yeah, bad yeah. memories. No, of course you are. <laughs> so it's stripped off round the Riverside pitch on the cinder track with all the office girls and everybody watching. And that was the fourth it. Now, listen, I'm not saying it was it was right and you couldn't do it nowadays, but goodness me, it was character building to have to go into a room of, of people. See, I think I think I think it is right because I, I think it... I think it grounds you. I think it was part of the thing. I don't think it was, you know, I, I, I've listened to and I've seen quite a few stories from other clubs. It was a, a quite a famous story at Northampton Town about um, players saying um, about bullying, um, etc. And listen, I've been there, you know what I mean? You're going, like Robbie said, you know what I mean? I did my first one at the at, at, at Essen Park and you walk in there and it's, by the time I, I've gone in, I'm shaking and my, my words for my Christmas song are in my hand and, and, and by the time I'm, I'm just about to start, it's covered in orange, covered in tea, covered in water. I've got claws all over me. I can't even see five yards in front of me. And you just want to get out there as quick as you can. You want to entertain. You want to be just a, a, the life and soul of a party. But it, for me, it was it was just something that you just it just had to be done. You know what I mean? I knew it was coming because my brother was a white at York who told me about it a couple of years before. So... You know what I mean? It was it was one of those things, and then at the end of it, you know what I mean? That we were, well, some of us were lucky enough to that you got paid for your you got your Christmas bonus from your um, from your pro who, 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 who you did boots for, and, and and you could spend it on Christmas presents or waste it yourself or do whatever. Because obviously we weren't well paid, Rob. Were we? You know what I mean? You, you're picking up wise no. yes money. You know that I think I, I think I remember my first year was for thirty seven pound fifty. I went up to forty two pound fifty and. And listen, you know what I mean, and, and uh, people wouldn't even get out of bed for that. You know, what I mean, you do, do a paper only get more money than that. So it's um, well, you, know you, I mean? it's you got your expenses as well, didn't you? So I remember my first yeah. year, I was getting the bus at half seven from Redcar, all into Middlebrook, but it went a long way around. So I was I had to get it that early to be at work on time. And then the second year, I got a car. I got a six hundred and fifty pound uh, Polo Fox car, but I was on the right little learner because I used to pick the Irish boys up on the way to training, on the way back. So I used to get their expense money as well. So I used to do a bit of a deal with Jason, Gary Murdoch, Burdock, uh, Ronnie O'Brien, people like that. So I had a car full. So I was actually bringing in a, a fair bit of money. I was actually on more money from my expenses than I was my wage. And did you pick them up with the mail? Yes. We were talking yeah. about that the other day with Cav, yeah. We were talking about that with Cav, yeah. when Cav came on the show. That it's, it's, it's one of those... 
one of those infamous places where all, all the lads obviously live together and you know what I mean it just it, it made the whole thing even more special Rob for me um, right moving on from uh, obviously being a young lad because um, as, a, as a white BS so you made your debut um, for the Mighty Reds um, how did you feel and more importantly as well how did your family feel because I, I know how proud I was and I know how proud, how proud my family was when I when I played for the club of, 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 of their dreams and my dreams you know because I know my dad watches the show um religiously um, so he'll tell you how proud he was of me but obviously I know your family as well so how proud were, you, were your family of you when you finally made oh, your debut? Massively it's like an accumulation of all this stuff that you're trying to, to get to um, I remember actually it was I found out the day before if I was going to play it was an FA Cup replay at home to QPR uh, when I was 17 and I'd found out Brian had pulled me the day before and said you're going to play um, and I remember sitting in the car or driving home back back to Red Cat, and it came on the radio, just like the, the local, I don't know what it was, BBC T, Radio Clear, whatever it was, um, and Brian had said I was going to play. And I remember sat there, hearing my name on the radio, thinking, shit, I'm going to be playing tomorrow. You know, that feeling of yeah, yeah. excitement, fear, everything. Um, you know, what do you wear? Nobody tells you that. Nobody tells you, is it track suit? Is it suit? You don't have a suit. So I'm, I end up going in a track, everybody else in suits first team boys but nobody tells you all these little bits you're just going for the game and um, obviously parents were over the moon and come and watch you um, and then the game almost is like a blur it's, it's the weirdest thing um, Trevor Sinclair had switched wings he came onto the left wing because he obviously knew I was making my debut and um, the only sort of vivid thing I remember is at some point I went up for a header and got cramp in both calves literally just seized up and I asked the ref ref how long how long we played he said 24 minutes and this was the first half so I'm cramping up in the first half just with nerves and obviously adrenaline and all the rest of it so um, that went well but again you're talking about grounding uh, the next game I was back on on kit duty so did we, did, we, did, we, did we win that game did we beat QPR 2-0 we won 2-0 2-0 ask, yeah ask, ask God that game I think ask God that ask God one of them did yeah, it's called first goal. Yeah. Go. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, I remember two that. Two, yeah. two nil, we won. Yeah, night game, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah, because yeah. we we drew we drew at Loftus Road. I think one all. I think Iggy scored one of the goals, and then uh, yeah, we beat him. I think Paul Merson. Paul Merson set me up for one of the goals for, for for my goal. Right. Yeah. But again, going into that team, you, you're playing alongside. I can't remember exactly what the back four, but Swartz will have been in goal. Nigel definitely played. Steve Vickers definitely played, and you're just thinking, actually, at the time, that's what you needed. Especially, yeah. and not this way, but making your debut as a defender as well. You know, the pressure that you're on to not make a mistake that might come, uh, lead to a goal. Having those two next year, Robbie Musto, probably in the team, and just helps you. It does help you a lot. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, Sai, we obviously, now we're going to, uh, we want to talk about, um, uh, obviously we laughed and joked, didn't we, about at the start about uh, about Robbie playing for England and and then moving alliances to, stock, to, to Scotland, but changing um, alliances and just yeah. basically disowning his country. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's so, nothing big. So Rob, talk us talk us through talk us through how did the England under twenty one call up come around then? Because obviously at the time you were playing regular football. Um, you know, I mean, you, you obviously played played regular. Well, you played more regular for the first team. You you're a household name, so to speak. You know what I mean? So you deserved your call up. So how did that come about? Yeah, so well, I don't know if people know, but it's as it's, it's simple as when you sign on as a YTS, you obviously fill in the forms and there's a section that says where your grandparents are born, because that's how far you can trace back to play for a nationality. And, um, my grandma was, was Scottish. So obviously at the time, you don't think anything on it, of it, eligible for Scotland because of her and obviously England with, with everybody else. So um, it was the season after I'd made my debut, I think, and I, I sort of played in and around the first team and I was flirting with not quite being a regular, but sort of getting a little bit of a, a, a name for yourself. And Peter Taylor was the manager who did 21s at the time. So I got a call up. I got two or three call ups, but never played. I was on the bench for each game and a couple of qualifiers. Um, and then, you know, I didn't, again, didn't really break into the Borough's team as a regular. And then we got a call up quite a little bit of time after for a game at the Riverside, if you remember, camps. Yeah. And I know for a fact I was only called up because I was a Borough lad, because I was nowhere near Borough's team at the time. 
No, I've said this. I've said this before, and I, and I, I felt as I felt that I felt that when I first when I first came around yeah. that um, that that was the only reason why I got a call up. And it was only probably the second time when I when I when I when I played the World Cup qualifier and the Euro, Euro qualifier that I felt as though I was I was I was deserving of a place. You know that it's yeah. And they've done and they, and they've done it in the past. By the way, they did it with they did it with Dale Fry a couple of years ago when they played Germany at the Riverside. I went to the game and. I, it's disrespectful, I find. You know that they do they do, they do those, these kind of things just to get a fan. You, you, you understand the fact that I'm not sure how many fans it would have put on the gate. To be honest, maybe two with mum and dad. But mum and dad, um, well, yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> but you kind of, you, you get it, don't you? You, you kind of get it. Anyway, um, <laughs> long story short, that that sort of drifted away. Um, I went out on loan a couple of times at Middlesbrough, came back. Um, thought I was going to leave and then there was a change of manager so Steve came in to replace Brian wanted to try and change the dynamics of the, the, the team and the squad a little bit I'd been really fortunate I'd played a game against Derby the previous season when Steve was assistant and we beat them 5-1 I think I had a good game and it kind of stuck in his mind and over over the next 18 months he just started to filter me in until, until I replaced Curtis I guess uh, I was regular in the Premier League, and that's when the Scotland call up came up. So, because I've not played a, um, a qualifier for the 21s with England, it, I was still eligible to play for another nationality. So, that's that's how that happened. So, I got, it was the infamous Bertie box. Was it an easy Was it an easy Scotland. decision, Rob, to to make that transition? Because obviously, you must have had a decision to make. To do I do I hold out and hope for England, or do I go with? No, with I can't it wasn't. It wasn't so much holding out for. I, I, you know, realistically, that was that wasn't going to happen. Um, again, yeah, going back to that obsession, I wanted to be the best I could be. I wanted to. Oh, I'd, I'd still do it. You, you played international football. You know, it's such yeah. a such an achievement. Not many people get to do it. Um, so no, it was obviously there was a little bit of stick flying about. But listen, I'm not the first person who's ever done it, and I'm, I'm, I won't be the last. So. I'm pleased I did it. Yeah, definitely. We, I, yeah. I, I've got no problem with this, I, mean. I, I, no, I I've no, got full no. respect for the way that Robbie's come out and, 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 and explained, um, you know what I mean, that do it do it again tomorrow because, listen, there's no prouder moment to play for um, for your country and it's also probably means even more, Rob, that it was the country of your of your grandma as well. So, you know what I mean, it's going back heritage. So you, 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 it, yeah, it, wasn't other, other it, wasn't it wasn't something that I just thought, oh, let's do it. Like I said, this goes back to 15, 16, where... They could have called me up then if they wanted to. You know, you, yeah. put, you, you put the information out there. I, listen, I accept it's probably not for everybody. There'll be some people that are very patriotic to that place. But I, I saw it as a, there's what? I, I'm going to play international football. I've played in front of 110,000 people mm -hmm. in Korea before the World Cup. And all these experiences make you better. And I wanted to do that. It would make me a better player uh, for when I came back to Middlesbrough. So... Um, I've discussed this a lot on the the cricket show. Obviously, it's in cricket, it's pre really prevalent where people play for countries different to where they were born. Um, and I think the, the issue in cricket sometimes people have is that they sometimes people use it as a as an advantage because they're not good enough to get into you know X team or whatever, which I don't think is the case in your case. But also. Um, the way Kieran Powell, who's West Indian, explained it is whatever your job is, whether you're a teacher or a, a lawyer, whatever, a footballer, is you want to get to the top of your field. You want to get as high as you can in your job. Um, and playing international football is the, the pinnacle of a, anyone's career. So if you get the opportunity to do that, then you're going to do it. And I think I totally, can't, I'm sorry, can't listen, fault it. I totally agree. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing been more proud, you know what I mean, for me. I think th those rules are there in place to allow you to do it because they want to encourage you to do it. They want to, you know, what I mean, they want you to do it. So for me, I've got no qualms with anybody doing it and and fulfilling dreams of. Robbie said there about playing in front of that many people. You know, what I mean, what chances have anybody got to play in front of that many people? It's just a, it's just a dream of of anybody's football yeah. football dreams of growing up. So I played my debut was up at uh, Pitodri. Uh, at Aberdeen and we played Nigeria of all, of all teams to play at Aberdeen Nigeria debut and honestly it was, it was such a proud moment and you, you know we can take that away from you at the end of the day can we? No 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 that's fine No that's brilliant uh, Rob you obviously had, a, had an amazing um, um, football career um, you went into um, coaching managing um, obviously 
caretaker at Grimsby. You mentioned uh, things about going into um, uh, in, in the youth setup at Grimsby, uh, but then obviously that led you into Sunderland, um, <laughs> and you went into the youth team, uh, youth team manager, a uh, youth team coach sorry, at Sunderland, um, and then obviously you've um, you've managed or caretaker managed Sunderland what two or three two or three times in in total, uh, three or four I think yeah, three or four was it in the end. Um, yeah. How did that feel? How did that? How did that feel? Um, knowing that you know, obviously worked under some very good managers, um, Kevin Ball, De Canio, um, David Moyes, uh, Chris Coleman. You know, what I mean, you've you've worked alongside and with uh, some amazing managers. How did it feel then taking over from the mantle from those kind of people? Um, it's difficult. You you only sort of get these. So, so the first time I've, I've done it was after Dick Advocate had left. So there was a gap between Dick come, uh, leaving and Sam Allardyce coming in. So I was do I was manager of the twenty ones at the time. So the club had asked me to, to oversee. It was an international break as well. So Sam came in, um, and for four or five days, Sam just watched what was what I was doing and how I was working. And we went to play West Brom away in the Premier League. And he said, "Come on, let's have a chat." So he called me just after dinner and said, "Listen, I've watched what you've been doing." Really, really like what you do. Um, he said, no, it's all but you're my new first team coach. We go, well, that's, that's great, fantastic. But I, I was always very wary as well. I was, again, going back to that, um, always wanted to do the best I could be. I was in no major rush to do it. You know, the, the, the journey was still ongoing. Yeah. So when I spoke to the club, I said, listen, you, I understand that Sam wants me to, to be part of the senior setup, but also I need some reassurances from you that Sam gets leaves in six weeks, six months, but I'm not part of that staff that just just gets, you know, I want to be able to go back to the academy if I could. So anyway, it developed, worked really well for Sam, absolutely such a, an education, people think. People have the, probably the wrong perception of, of what he is. Um, he's a massive delegate. I played, for, I that, played for Sam. I played for Sam at Bolton, and uh, I've I've not got a bad word to say about the man. You know, no. he's, a, he's fantastic. Do you know? Do you know what he did to staff? He gave you he gave you responsibility, but you felt he's got my back. But also, he'd yeah. be very harsh on you as well. Constantly yeah. asking me why why are you doing that? What what, what what's the plan behind that, that? And as long as I could show him why, he'd have no problem with it. So then, yeah. then uh, Man City, the Greenies, Man City, and. Uh, I would come up with a session, but if you ever watch Pellegrini's teams, it's exactly the same when he's West Ham. The back four never ever drop you on the 18 yard box until the ball's gone in. So it leaves a really big gap. So I, all week we were planning on, as soon as we get it into top 25 yards out from the touchline, can we bend it into that space and get the runners going in? So the first time I did the session, he's, he'd never do it in front of people, but he pulled out, what, what is that? What, what's going on? So as soon as I showed him the video that I'd come up with to show, he was like all over it. So he, he almost felt the room being responsible for someone like Sam. And he, he'd give you a little bit of me way to do what I wanted, which was great. And then like say, some, of the, some of the people that came in after him, David, really good to work for as well. They tactically thought about the game, very, very detailed. Um, did every, Did a lot himself. Truth be told, on the training pitch, but a real, real good guy. Um, yeah. And then obviously we had the Netflix year with Simon. And, and tell me, and, tell, tell me, tell me about this then, because I've I watched I watched all the series. You know, I mean, watched it. Um, I, I watched it the first time um, as a Middlesbrough fan. You know, what I mean, just to probably cheer myself up a little bit and think that well, nothing can get any worse than this. So whatever whatever happens in Middlesbrough is is a, is a bonus. Um, and then I watched it again all the way through as. Probably with a different view on it. Um, I looked at it from people that I knew. Um, obviously, knew you. Um, I knew Louise Wanless, uh, who still works for the football club. Um, knew yeah. other people, um, um, physios, etc. Some of the players that I've, I've come across. Um, and I thought, how do I feel? Or how would I feel um, if I was involved in it or embro- embroiled in it? And I started to feel a little bit sorry that um, why the club had agreed to do it. Um, did you have any input? Of, I mean, I don't mean you personally, but who whose decision was it to, to, to agree to it all? Well, I, I got asked, so that year that we got to get from the Premier League, they left pretty soon after. And it was quite a long time before Simon came in. So, again, I was in interim charge and I was putting into place a sort of pre-season, and, which I've done actually the year before. And um, I got asked to 
just do a squad analysis of where I think we should be recruiting and um, not for many of those players got bought, unfortunately, because it would have improved us, no doubt. Um, so I got asked about the Netflix and, and listen, not that I had any bearing on it happening, but I actually thought, do you know what? The way it was sold to me was it would show good light on the football club and it'd be more behind behind the scenes of the people behind the scenes, if that makes yeah. sense, the people around the club. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was very strong on, well, if that's the case, then we need to make sure that what we let them have access to we're in control of. So I've, I've got to be honest, I've never watched it. I've not seen one episode of it. Okay. Um, it, was a, it was a real difficult time just being it. So... Yeah, the thing is, um, what, what, what you just said there is quite interesting because you said there that it was sold to you in a way that um, about being behind behind the scenes, and some of the episodes are, are exactly that. And 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 to be fair, it, it, it shows boardroom level, it shows conversations between sponsorships, etc. Which which I, I I was embroiled in, and I was and I couldn't stop watching because I, it's a part of a club which you want to watch, you want to see how a club's run. Is it run the right way? Is it run from mm-hmm. top to bottom? Because you you see what's happening on the pitch as a fan on a TV, you, or you can make your own mind up. You can't make your own mind up in the boardroom because you have not got a clue what's going on. Yes, you can guess. Yes, you can you can make your own judgment. But to see that in its own light is quite really. It's quite really. Well, it was it was in, it was really interesting. Um, but yeah. I, I, in hindsight, then how would if 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 it was your decision and you could turn the clock back and you got asked the question again, uh, would you answer it in the same same way that you answered the first time? Um, I, I think. I said, I wasn't. I knew I wasn't going to be manager. I knew the yeah. role with the club would be what I wanted it, or what it was going to be. Um, would I do it again? I don't. I think it's difficult. I think, like I said, I've not seen it. You can answer this question for me, but I would imagine that the football side of it, you didn't really see behind the scenes of a change, or you didn't really see the staff talking about players so much. No. And those were those are the things that the inner sanctum within a football club are now. So. Um, those are the me- those are the meetings we have yeah. within the manager's room, but don't see the light of, of day. So on that side, of it, did it really affect me that much? No. Have I been told that it come across okay? Yeah. Have I been told that the program is really good? I have by, by more than yeah. one person. Than yeah, you just good, don't yeah. Yeah. So would you do it again? Possibly. The only difference is you try and win. You'd have to win, wouldn't you? Yeah, That's, well, things like it. Yeah. Listen, it, it could have gone the other way. It could have, it could have been a really, a really positive outcome. It could have been promotion back to the Premier League, the first one, and then it could have been promotion back to the. Talk, That's, yeah, and that's, the, and that's the plan, isn't it? But um, interesting question. So, have the kids watched it? Yes. Yeah. How did? How did? Uh, what was the feedback from the from the from the kids? Um, they just they just want to talk about the players. What was he like? What was he yeah. like? Um, do, do, do you know? I mean, we. Uh, I kind of goes back to what size point was with Barcelona earlier. Um, the biggest, the biggest thing you can get right at a football club is recruitment, recruitment of players. It is by far the the, the defining factor of whether you be successful or you're not. Yeah. Um, and we the club, dare I say, it, didn't get recruitment right. Yeah, no, we didn't get it right the year before either. You know, yeah. they, they, some of the players that we brought in were players that weren't ready to step up. But Sunderland is a massive club with huge amount of pressure on to perform. Well, you, just beat me, you just beat me to a comment I was just about to say there that, um, you know, it pains me to say this, by the way, but Sunderland is an absolute huge football club and the, yeah, fan, base is, yeah. the, fan, base, the fan base is amazing. They travel, they travel in thousands to away games. They sell, when, when that stadium is full, there's no better place to play and watch your football. You know, I've watched a game there full. I've played there myself and it's... Uh, it's an extremely intimidating atmosphere, but then I can guess on the other on the other side of the coin that you said earlier when um, when things aren't going great, you know what I mean. The players can sometimes go into the shell a little bit, and that has a negative effect on your own performance if you're not mentally and physically strong enough. Yeah, yeah no, that's right. An expectancy which is rightly deserved. That everything's geared up for it to be a, a, a top Premier League club. But I think back to those first few months when time came in, and the way we finished the week. Again, you talk about recruitment. We made three signings in January that kept us up. Uh, Jan Kirchhoff, yeah, yeah. Edvia and Kazri and Kone. 
yeah. Lamin Corday as well. These players came in and kept us up, and the, what you said there, probably the best atmosphere I've ever experienced, ever, at the club was when we beat Preston 3 0 to stay up. It was, it was unreal. It was like, wow, hairs on the back of your neck, sort of stuff. And you need big characters to play in that type of environment. You do. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's why and that's why we do it. That's why we all live to play football and coach football and you know what I mean? For those kind of moments in front of big big stadiums and, and just and just won it over and over and over again. Uh, before we because uh, we obviously we're gonna go into some live questions from uh, from some of the from some of the viewers which is done. Final question I'll I'll, I'll throw it to Rob on uh, on Netflix is will you ever watch it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, there might be a time. Um you know, there's lots of clubs doing it now, aren't there? I think Leeds United have put one out now. Man City have done one in the past. Um, will Will I ever watch it? Possibly. I don't know. Do you, again, it's it's one of those things that uh, honestly it was a real tough time anyway. So will I watch it? Maybe. Maybe. I think you should. Listen, I'm not. I'm not telling you what I do because I wouldn't dream of it. You know, what I mean, you're a good friend of mine, and um, you've been a, a, an, an exceptional pro, and, you, and you're currently a. Uh, a very good coach, stroke manager, and I, listen, you, you come out of it very well. I, I, there's only certain individuals at that football club who come out with it um, not looking great. Um, but listen, it, it is what it is. It it could have been the best story in the world for for that football club because that was the plan. And if it if if that had happened, then it would have generated a lot more money. It would have generated a lot more enthusiasm for everybody and, and stuff. And it would have been it would have been a, a, a uh, probably a different story in a different program, but for me, it's a, it's a, it was a fantastic yeah. watch, and um, I'll, I'll watch it again because I, I think it's I think it's a really good really good thing to watch. It's a, Netflix got it right, didn't they? They fell they yeah. on the feet because they thought they yeah. want to be a promotion thing, which would have been in to be Sunderland fans, and but to see how it went, I think everybody got involved. With Netflix the ones that were out. And I think, and I think that's why, Rob. I think that's why. Um, obviously, the second, the, the 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 more series they end up doing was because of the way that, it, that, that, that the first one ended, because it fell in their hands. It was perfect situation scenario for them, and um, yeah, and it couldn't have gone any better for them personally. You know what I mean? Yeah, the demise of a football club is, is never nice. You know what I mean? The the, the first game of pre season against Celtic, I think it was, not you know what I mean? That for me, that it's just it just looked at a heartbreaking um, situation, and and Netflix just pounced on it and just. It, it worked great for them, and you know, what I mean, and that's what they are—the the, the producers of of great work and great shows. And yeah, it was another great show. Listen, by them. I, I've got to say, I don't want people to get this wrong. The guys that were in the building filming it were brilliant, absolutely fantastic, very respectful. They did yeah, ask, you know, can we have access to this? And no one, there was no never yeah. never a second question asked about that. But no, it was uh, it was interesting. Pal. It was interesting. Fair play, yeah. fair play. Um, so right, we're going to finish yes. up with some uh, some um, live questions for Rob. And also, the Netflix uh, documentary led to Amazon going on and doing their own thing with Man City and Man City ones. That's a good one. That's a good. That's another good one. But they they might not have dipped their toe into that if they you know if the Sunderland one hadn't have been so uh, so good in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we got some questions which have been sort of coming throughout the show. Uh, so I got to start at the bottom and work my way up. We got. Uh, Reese says, "What is what is it that you, as a coach or a coach and a manager, see in players that fans don't?" Um, what do you see? I think if I think of the best players, um, and it gives it goes back to that obsession. The, the the best players are the ones that live professionally and do all the things right. And it's twenty four seven. I I. I People, people look at footballers as oh, it's unachievable. I think it's a job. It, mm. it is, it's your profession. And if you're not fully focused, especially with the game as it is now at the top level, if you're not living your life right, if you're not, um, I can go back to that word obsessed, but so professional in your attitude towards recovery, to training, to being physically as strong as you can, to being mentally as strong as you can, then... You, you won't you won't reach the standards. So I think of players that I've coached that I would put into that bracket. Um, yeah, these couple of ones would be John O'Shea, for example, who was at the end of his career but did everything unbelievably well to, to extend his career. Jermaine Defoe, you know, one of professional trained. But Rob, uh, Rob, do you, f- do, you, do, you, do you feel sorry though then for these kind of players who get the stick that they get from supporters when you see them day in day out, um, week in week out? Uh, is is sometimes a stick to get a little bit unjust? 
listen, they still have to perform on a Saturday. You know, that's that that, that that's the be all or end all. What what I'm trying to say is these players are doing all that they can to be at peak performance on a Saturday at three o'clock. Um, you know, we had we get involved into this. We we had players that were doing that. You know, you know, you couldn't rely on them on a Saturday. You can win or lose or draw as a manager or coach on a Saturday. But if you know that the players have given the role Monday to Friday on the Saturday, you live with that. So what you you're saying? Are you, are you saying? Are you saying it's nothing to do with the players? It's all down to the manager and the coach's fault. Hmm. <laughs> no, I've never said that. <laughs> 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 uh, but no, so, so you, see, you see that side of it and you also see sort of the human side of it going back to the question you know yeah. you see you see the downs that they get you see the players that sometimes need that little arm on the shoulder um, especially the high up you play those times at Sunderland it was you know the, the pressure was really high to stay in the league in the Premier League how many great escapes can you can you do and um, does it help? Though, does it also it, help, Rob, that, that you've played the game as well? That you know, what I mean, that as a young lad coming through, that you know what he's going through. When a lad's coming back from international duty, you know what he's going through. When a lad's having a bad true. game, I'm not saying you had a bad game, by the way, but I'm just saying when you know, you know what they're going through. Listen, I, I can only I can speak for myself and say I think it helped me, but I wouldn't say it should put off somebody who's not played that they can't. There's been brilliant managers that have yeah. never played the game to so a standard. Your Mourinho's, your Wenger's, and and things like that, um, you know, I would never ever say that somebody who's not played the game, don't try and do that. I, I think that would be wrong. People have got different strengths. I think back to, I think back to some of the coaches I had at senior level, who probably didn't play to the level I played at as managers, players, but as managers, you still related to them. So I think yeah. it's, I think the game now is so much about mind management. Yeah. Really, it's, you know, tactics and everything come with it. But if you can manage the people, then you've got such a good chance of success. Spot on. Um, also, uh, Richie asks, who is your toughest opponent and uh, who was your football icon Me. Uh, before and during <laughs> during your career as well? Well, I'll get... Uh, Cam's is my icon. Never mind. <laughs> toughest, <laughs> uh, toughest opponent. That, that's, that's quite easy, really. We... For some reason, whenever we played Arsenal, and Arsenal had an unbelievable team, um, it was Mark Overmars. Ridiculous. It was Mark Overmars. I remember him turning me inside out time and time. I'm talking over a period of time here as well, not just one game. I used to remember, I vaguely remember playing at the other side against him. And it was probably the game that beat us 5 or 6 1 where Canu scored the back heel. Oh, yes, yes, yes. 7 7 7 1, Rob, it was. <laughs> I think I was only on the pitch for six of them, though. Yeah. <laughs> I was still didn't get on. I was buzzing. Buzzing, I was. Yeah. And I remember um, Winterburn had the ball sort of 30 yards away. And Overmars went short. And I thought, well, I don't want him to get the ball to run at me because he's so quick. So as I've gone to get tight, he just spun. And Winterburn's chipped it off our heads. So there's no catching him that way. So I thought, well, don't fall for that again. Let him get the ball and let him have a run at me. See if I can deal with that. <laughs> Straight back. So I'm good. I've only got two ways to stop them. Get tight doesn't work and dropping off doesn't work. And it's just a horrible place to be. Because then the, the, the top players, like you say, it's several, they smell blood, don't they? There's no coming off them. They're just, it's just relentless. It's horrible. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's scary though, isn't it? You know what I mean? Because you're talking about that time. You know what I mean? And at that time as well, even the Man United's, the Giggs's, the Beckham's, you know what I mean? That the, the interchange and it's just, it's horrible. You know what I mean? That, 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 that is, we got, always did okay uh, against them. United, we always sort of did yeah, okay. We did, we, yeah, we did. We, yeah, we did. I, it was, I think it's, all, it, it's it's difficult, isn't it? You know what I mean? Because being a fullback, um, you know what I mean? At, at the time, when you, when you, the Premier League was quite strong winger-wise, you know what I mean? There was quite a lot of wingers coming through and, and Pace was Pace was starting to come into the Premier League as well. You know what I mean? There was there was a lot of it as well. You know what I mean? Every every single yeah. young young player was coming through with Pace. The Michael Owens, the Anelkas, the Overmars. Uh, it was just it was just coming relentless. It was becoming relentless. And you, you talked to somebody who didn't really have pace either. <laughs> <So it was awesome. laughs> um, okay, final final question or two, I suppose. Uh, so I'll go to the sort of the one question, uh, which was from uh, Mr. Stuart Campbell, very handsome chap. Le he's a legend, I think. I've heard. Legend of a chap, legend and he is. says, um, "How much would Messi cost a team from the Premier League?" 
What a bad question that is. What a, what a rubbish question. I think he did send it when we were talking about it, though. So well, yeah. Still a rubbish question. I'm not answering it. Robbie, I'm answer a... that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I refuse. I've seen him today. I don't know if he answers his question. Like, right? like a petulant teenager. <laughs> 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 if you get slapped, you will. Um, I don't know. What would he... 100? I don't know how old is he. You're not paying... It's an interesting. Well, it's an interesting question. Will, will he have a? Will he have a uh, clause in his contract? Was, uh, there was a rumor. He had. There is a rumor. He had like a five hundred million release clause or something stupid. No one's going to pay ago. that. No one's going to pay that. No. I don't think. I don't think any club should or would pay over a hundred for him when you consider his age. It's. There's no. You're not going to get. Like I guess unless you're going to go with. You know, you might get two great seasons out of him and win trophies, but it's whether you know if you don't win the biggest trophies, it's just a hundred million. And and Sai, yeah, who's going who's, who's to pay? Who's going to pay his what? tax? Who's going to pay his tax bill? Yeah, mate. There's, 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 any, you know? there's like three three <laughs> clubs. Maybe you could afford him. On, 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 on the flip side of that, and being in conversations within football clubs where you talk about buying players from certain parts. If you're, let's just say, there's only a couple of clubs that can afford it, Man City. Man City will be doing the sums now to say, if we spend £100 million on him, we could probably get £300 million of sheer sales all over the world. Yeah. He'll pay for himself. Do you know what I mean? There's other things to... to yeah. do. My, my kid got messy tops. He's not a Barcelona fan or anything like that, but you buy it because it's messy. Do you imagine yeah, yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. And I, so, I, 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 I also, I the money men, the money men all have a look at it as well and think this can be done. This. Yeah, I also think as well. I think I think Messi's got a, a, a relationship with Barcelona and a, and a, a, a probably a contract. Which if he says he wants to leave, you know what I mean. Forget release clause. You know, if he says I really want to leave, they'll they'll help him out and, and let him go wherever he wants to go. Because listen, the, Robbie just said there. There's only a certain clubs who can afford him. But he might not want to go to those kind of clubs. But he, Messi wants to go to the teams that he wants to go to, and he'll dictate that. He'll dictate that all yeah. day long because he's he's in charge of he's in charge of football, isn't he? You know what I mean? He's the he's boss like man. Yeah, he is, isn't he? Uh, yeah, he's second best player in the world, isn't he? Behind me, is that right? <laughs> behind uh, <laughs> behind Keeper Moore. <laughs> no, yeah. no, it's behind. Um... I hope he scores a bucket full of goals. By the way, <laughs> no, I so, will. Do you know what? Right, I'll, I'll, I'll right, right? Yeah, Robbie's going to come back home when Keeper Moore scores. They had to the put Cardiff in the, in the in the Premier League next year. There we go. Yeah. Reverse, so, like, reverse yeah. psychology, isn't it? Reverse psychology. I'm yeah, it's rubbish. Rubbish. Um, all right. Final question of the evening from uh, the live chat. James Costley said, "What was it like playing at Ninian Park?" Uh, I know you were in the side when Cardiff beat Rotherham 2 0. Was it intimidating? Well, I have to say yes, Warner. I? I don't particularly mm. remember that game. I do remember Ninian Park was my debut for West Ham on a tea time kickoff on a on a Saturday evening. And we always batted West Ham as well, that. didn't they? They always batted them as well. I think it was 1 1. I think it was 1 1. I think Carrick scored. But yeah, I do remember that, that game. It, 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 but Robbie, did it remind you a little bit of Ayrson Park? Did it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously, when I went yeah, there, it was, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was just yeah. it was just it was exactly the same as Ayrson Park, but blue. And it was just it was a the atmosphere was hostile. It was everyone was it. It felt as though there was a lot more people in there every time I played there. Obviously, I played there quite a few and, times. And, but it, and, I, and I do miss those type of grounds as well. Yeah, and I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, they're very atmospheric, aren't they? Exactly what you said about not the same now. Park. Not the same now. No. No, but you, it was one of those grounds where you could stand up one side of the pitch and not see the the, the socks of the other because it had a camper in the middle of the pitch. Yeah, did you? The pitch was, you know, and Essen Park was the same, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was a t- t- top ground. Miss, I miss those kind of places. I, you know, the new stadium's nice, and they had to go there for a, a business uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the model. But you know, I do, I do. Yeah, I feel, uh, I feel as if they could have stayed there a little bit longer, they could have achieved a little bit more, and probably stayed in the Premier League a few more seasons, in my opinion. Um, okay, so Andy, I know you've got one more question, which we'll go to now. But before we do that, I just wanted to uh, show the viewers this. I think it's a, a good, nice way to what a what a photo. Look at those two. There beauties. we go, Rob. Right. So that that was that was nineteen. That was nineteen. Oh, that was nineteen ninety nine. Uh, and we just my mum took that photo, Rob. By the way, that's in my mum's house, and we yeah. That was just before Player of the Year do. So we went to where uh, we went there in our wow. in our dicky boat, and uh, next to me. Is Jason Gavin? I didn't. I, I cut him off because I didn't want to. Uh, I was. I didn't. I was. I was permission to have him on the show, so I didn't want to put him on. 
Um, Jason's, out, J- Jason's, Jason's out as well. Like, like Robbie's, Robbie's just beautiful hair. Just, just makes you sick, doesn't it? And bald hair and all, by the way. One of us hasn't changed a bit, have we? It's yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Well, no. <laughs> bald and loads of, loads of lines on my head, yeah. Look at Robbie. Makes you sick, doesn't it? Makes you sick, doesn't it? Good there days, go. good, good days, Brilliant. good days. Right, Rob, yeah, no, to, uh, to to finish off, uh, I've got one more question. So my question to Robbie Stockdale is, um, how would Robbie Stockdale, a manager and the coach, manage Robbie Stockdale, a player? Oh, good question. Good question. I think I think we both, and this is going to be a bit of a cop I think we both would have longevity more now if we played now with what managers and coaches know. And by that, I mean, um, when we were growing up, sports science wasn't really a thing. It was not position-specific work that managers and coaches do now. I think we'd have a lot more longevity at that level that that we we managed to get to. Yeah, I I totally agree as well. And and I also think... um, um, uh, I'd also give myself a massive pay rise. Life's, yeah, life's evolved as well. I don't think I don't think alcohol plays uh, as big part in life now than it did probably when we were back um, back younger. Um, you know what I mean? Things I know. I know you. You know what I mean? It, it's part of a lifestyle. There was a big drinking culture involved in football at the time when when we were coming through uh, as younger players, and it's now uh, it's now a little, you're a lot more fitter, a lot more tougher. Uh, it's like you say, sports science is involved, so you've got to be about recovery and stuff. And that was all new. You know what I mean? I, I, you, you mentioned Sam Allardyce earlier on, um, and that was the first time I came across it. And Sam was uh, well above and beyond everyone else's years um, when he was at Bolton, by the way. So he was. I knew when um, when people started to give him negative comments, I used to uh, shoot him down quite rapidly and say how positive and um, all the things that he was doing back then before everyone else was doing it. I forget all these foreign managers coming in and having all these top superstars. He was well ahead of the well ahead of the game. Oh, that's but, yeah, but but I I totally agree with there. But you know what I mean. I, I, listen, I I saw you grow up as a as a young player. You're obviously a little bit younger than me, only only a few months, I'm guessing. But um, uh, seeing you pull through the middle of the team, and you know what I mean. Obviously, we went our separate ways, and it makes me so proud, mate. When I when I when I see you on the touchline, obviously watch the Netflix thing. Obviously, seeing you go to Scotland, and um, and really really look forward to to your next journey, and um, and hope that when the next journey does come along, whatever that may be in the world. Um, that you come back on the show and tell us all about it. No, it's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. It's been. Um, it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I don't get to do this very often. Talk about the, 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 the old times, if you like, and, and growing up. But I think. I think as a final thing, what we talked about before, people call it old-fashioned values. I, I don't. I just see it as values. It's yeah. what you know. There's no need for it to be old-fashioned. It's just doing the right things at the right time and treating people properly. I think yeah. if 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 football can do that more, then everybody, everybody be a winner. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I totally 100%. agree, and I, yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I couldn't have put it better myself. But no, uh, an amazing show. You know, what I mean, the feedback we've had um, on here uh, when we announced you as a guest. You know, what I mean, the, the amount of positivity and the amount of um, good things that people have to say about you is a credit to yourself and, and to your family. So, no, good luck, mate, and uh, and hope everything works out for the way you want it. Indeed. Um, Thanks, guys. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Robbie, it's been fantastic to have you, mate. Uh, we've had our biggest YouTube audience ever as well in the live uh, in the cool. live show, which is cool, really cool. Uh, so I encourage all those people to subscribe. And, uh, of course, you can catch uh, all our other shows. We've got another show coming out Wednesday. And we'll be, me and Andy will be back on Friday with a uh, Andy Campbell Football Show Extra. Are we going to tell them what it's about and or not? Yes. Do you, do you want me to do it or do you want to do yeah, it? Yeah, go on. You crack on, mate. Um, we decided, obviously, last week we did a, a special show with referee Jeff Winter about uh, officials and stuff. Um, cheers, Grim. Thank you. Uh, this week we've got Jason Ainsley, who is Spenny Moore Town Manager. We're doing a non-league show. So Jason's going to come on and tell us about his experience about being a non-league manager. We've got ex-Cardiff City, Bath City, um, Gethin Jones, um, good friend of the show, good friend of mine. Um, who's obviously played non-league football for a number of teams, going to give us, us his experience about being a non-league player. Um, obviously, I've got the experience as well um, from moving down the leagues when I got a little bit older, more experienced. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a different a different angle. And then the following Friday, we've got um, a plan up our sleeve, which we'll announce hopefully Friday uh, if, it all, if it all pulls off. But I think uh, we're, about, we're about 75% there, I think. 
yeah, we've got, got some good ones for that. And yeah, we've got some good guests coming up as usual. Uh, massive thank you to Black Diamond Sports, Bespoke Financial as well for the sponsorship. And um, Reese just asked, when does the, the new show, which I'm doing with Super Kev McNaughton, start? We are filming the first one next Tuesday. Uh, and that'll be a monthly show, but you'll have to wait. But we're filming the first one next Tuesday. So send in your clips and stories about all things crazy football. But uh, until Friday, we thank you all for watching and listening if you download it. And uh, we will see you Friday for another live show. Thank you very much, Robbie. And thank you very Cheers, much, Rob. Mr. Campbell. My pleasure, Cheers, man. guys. See you soon. Cheers, Rob. My mummy and daddy have been talking about life insurance. It sounds like something to protect my brother and me, but I don't really understand. Then my Auntie Louise told Mummy about Bespoke Financial Teesside. She said they're a local company who helped her with her life insurance. Mummy got in touch and because they're based locally, a man called Darren was able to come to our house. He was really friendly. Darren stayed for a cup of tea and made it all really easy to understand. He said that life insurance will protect our home and family if anything bad were to happen. Like if Mummy or Daddy got sick. Then we'd get enough money to take care of us, and our house would be paid for so we wouldn't get taken away. After an hour, Darren said goodbye and Mummy and Daddy seemed a lot happier. Once it was all sorted, we could all relax and watch a film together as a family. I don't know why they didn't do it sooner.